Hey guys, Sam Skeppis from JPS Health and Fitness here. Today we're going to talk about tracking macros. Um, and I'm just going to cover a few fundamentals that we really need to address to make sure that we're getting the most out of the process uh, when we're looking to manage our nutrition. Now I'll start by saying what gets measured gets managed. So that applies to a lot of things in life, particularly in our training and nutrition endeavors. The more that we can control what we are doing, the better off we're going to be in the long run. So we're going to kind of keep that in mind and that at the forefront uh, as I go through just a handful of key points that I think are really beneficial to effective nutrition management and to help you succeed with whatever your nutrition or dietary goals are. <clears throat> so firstly, I, we recommend typically using the app MyFitnessPal as our preferred uh, tracking or measuring uh, modality. Uh, there are other apps out there, you can use them. Um, the reason we recommend MyFitnessPal is just because that's the one we're most familiar with, been using it uh, at JPS Health and Fitness for a decent uh, period of time now. Um, so that being said, presuming that everyone from here on out is using MyFitnessPal, when you are setting up and you have your macros or your targets and we need to actually input them, uh, it's important to remember that you don't need to be like absolutely perfect. Um, you don't need to have your macros and calories to the absolute gram. Um, we just want to be as close as we can within reason, right? Remember, this is the real world. Perfection is often comes at a cost that we're not necessarily willing to pay. But let's say you have your targets and now we need to set them up. So simply go into my fitness pal, click down the bottom right hand corner, more, navigate to the section or the subsection goals under nutrition goals, and there you'll be able to in, in input your macros, your protein, fats, and carbs in a percentage relative to your daily calories. Now, important to note that the premium version of MyFitnessPal will allow you to actually control your macronutrient targets to the gram, um, which is obviously, that's great because you could very easily tie it in to your targets that you've been prescribed on your tracker <clears throat> or by your coach. However, that will cost you more money because you have to pay for the premium subscription, which might not be necessary. So instead, we can just go with the standard subscription and simply use the nearest percentage, right? It's in 5% five per five increments for the protein, fats, and carbs. And we just want to measure them up, making sure they obviously equal 100%, get them to as close as you can to your targets. There will be a little bit of a variance on average, but that's okay. Um, it's not going to make or break the process. Now, second, now that you're set up, you have your targets set and you're like, great, this is, this is excellent. I'm, going, I'm ready to succeed. Now, what are you gonna track? All right, everything. Other than water, um, realistically, again, the more you track, the better off you'll be. Um, oftentimes people, you know, clients, anyone, myself, you know, you might be like, oh, I'm not going to track, you know, something because there's only a handful of calories. It's very easy to get into a bit of a trap where you end up doing that multiple times throughout a day, throughout a week, throughout a month, and you end up consuming more calories than you're actually bargaining for. So if you're in the early stages of your tracking career, it probably will pay in the long term to familiarize yourself with tracking even those kind of, you know, lower calorie items, things that are like, you know, two calories, five calories, because they will add up um, and we need to account for them somewhere. Over time, if you're not tracking them, they probably will get accounted for anyway, because let's say you're tracking say 2000 calories, but you've accidentally been eating 2200. Well, when you're, the scales aren't moving in the right direction, eventually you're going to have to make a change and you, you might take a hundred calories off. Now you're tracking 2100 even though your calories or you're eating 2,100, even though your calories say you're eating 1,900, right? So that discrepancy will still be there, but you'll intuitively make changes because the results aren't actually happening. <clears throat> so now that we've kind of covered that, tracking as much as you can, uh, obviously within reason, that is kind of the gold standard. That is what we all want to be aiming for. Now, how to actually track it. That is the most important thing right we're not just guessing we again want to be deliberate in the way that we're approaching our tracking to make sure that we're as accurate as humanly possible right 
remember, all this process is just a controlled, you know, like controlling of variables. That's all we're really trying to do as we track our nutrition. <clears throat> so a few key recommendations here is weigh and measure as much as you can in advance. So we wanna try and do all of the tracking, measuring and weighing, you know, all of that kind of groundwork before you actually consume it. Because what we often find is if you track your intake retrospectively, well, maybe you're going to let yourself get away with something or maybe it was, you know, 100 grams when it was actually, you know, 105 grams and you just track it a little bit wrong, you'll make it fit. Um, so tracking in advance will allow you to be more on top of that and to let yourself get away with less uh, mistakes and you'll just have less leniency. So once you have your item, you're going to search it on my fitness pal, or if you can scan the barcode and see if it comes up. And if you were tracking say items like chicken breast, right. And you're, you're not searching it by the actual brand name or the actual product name. You've just searched a generic, the name of the actual uh, food item compare different options that are available in your tracking app. The reason we want to do that is because there will be a discrepancy in the entries and we don't want to fall in the trap of just going for the first one that we see or necessarily the one that has a green tick or the one that has the lowest calories, right? Sometimes people do that. You scan something and go, Oh, well this one says it only has hundred calories and this one says it has 200 calories, hundred calories fits in and I'm going to be able to eat more food. That is not the right way to go about it. Although you might feel better about overeating. Um, it's not necessarily going to help you get towards your goals. <clears throat> so, Search in MyFitnessPal, be as accurate as you can, like a Google search. The more information you put in, the more accurately you can enter your search. Hopefully, the more accurate the entries that come up that you'll be able to select from will be. Now that you have found your food item and when you enter it, we want to make sure that we're using the right portion size. Okay, so serving sizes, portion sizes, they can be a little bit of a tricky one and oftentimes they can create problems when you are tracking. So I typically, personally, I try and track using grams. Uh, I find that is the easiest way. Um, if I've weighed something and it's 110 grams, and then I'll go and search that product, I'll find it, <clears throat> I'll change the metrics, say from like a fraction or like mils or cups to a gram serve, and then I'll enter in the amount. So if it was 110 grams, let's say it's 1.1 of 100 gram serve. Uh, alternatively, you can use a one gram serve and then just do, you know, one to one. Now, <clears throat> when you are looking at different foods and you're making your decisions as to how you are going to eat for the day, pay attention to nutrition labels as much as you can. We can dis we'll discuss about that in another video in a little bit more depth. But for now, just look at nutrition, uh, the serving sizes on the nutrition label and be aware that sometimes what you might track as a serve and what you might consume, um, thinking that it's a serve, might be two different things. Some good examples are, from memory, a Kit Kat. So the, the one with the four uh, individual or the four connected biscuits or sweets, whatever you want to call them. That's actually tracked as two servings. So I don't really know anyone who eats a Kit Kat um, in two sittings, but that's the way it is. Cereals are another one. So typically, you know, a serving of cereal is around, you know, anywhere from 28 to 45 grams. Um, if you actually put that in a bowl, it's a lot less than a lot of people would typically call a serving. So again, just pay attention to your serving sizes. That's where using scales, measuring cups, you know, that's going to really pay off and it's going to minimize the amount of mistakes and errors that you make. And it's going to allow you to get further in the process a lot quicker. All right. <clears throat> now a common one, um, a common question that we get is how should you weigh foods, particularly, you know, your meats, your vegetables, fruits, things like that, where there might be actual preparation involved. So typically we recommend weighing and measuring your foods raw and entering them raw as well. The reason being is that different cooking methods will have different implications on the weight or water retention on various products. So let's think of chicken breast, for example, if I was to cook chicken breast in a pan, 200 grams of chicken breast. I put 200 grams in a pan, I put 200 grams in a pot of boiling water. Now, the pan is going to evaporate some of the water and that chicken is going to come out a little bit lighter when it's cooked and done. 
the boiling water might allow it to retain more fluid. So when it comes out, you have two different variations of cooked chicken. One will weigh, the boiled will weigh heavier than the fried. Um, that is, comes down to water retention, just the way that we cooked it. Um, and that's why if we can, we would like to typically weigh and measure raw. It just takes out one extra variable um, and it means you can be a little bit more controlled and have a better idea about actually what you're consuming. Sometimes, you know, if you overcook your chicken, well, maybe you're eating even more chicken than you knew. Um, and, you know, potentially that's going to create problems down the track. <clears throat> so again, weighing and measuring raw is a good idea. Sometimes it's not super practical. Maybe you can't do it because you're eating out or whatever. Um, just do your best. Um, if you're eating, say, cooked chicken and you couldn't weigh it raw, then just search cooked chicken and off you go. Another one, a really important one, is if you can't weigh, track and measure, that's okay. Not the end of the world. Reality is that, you know, oftentimes in your life, you will not be able to put food on the scales. That is absolutely okay. No one expects you to do it every second of every day. But when you are in those situations and you are tracking or you're you know, trying to be a little bit more diligent with your nutrition, you want to control those variables, something, entering something, having a guess, an estimated, well, you know, a guesstimation, trying to be as accurate as you can in your guess is a really good way to do that. So again, don't just, you know, leave it and go, oh, that was maybe a thousand calories or something. Actually try and enter it. It'll help you build the skill of, you know, guessing and you know working out what ingredients are in certain meals so you can improve on your nutrition education and your iq long term so you have a better understanding and you have the tools to be able to do that down the track um, another good way to build the, these skills is to prepare your food and then say to yourself i think this is around this portion size and then you enter away that way you can start to build the skill of being able to eyeball different food variations and their weight, which can be really handy down the track. Um, not necessarily something we recommend for people who are just starting out or just getting started with their nutrition and tracking. We wanna be a little bit more controlled in these early stages. But again, try and build those skills because long-term we don't want you to track, we wanna move away from that. We want you to live your life, make good decisions that you are confident with and comfortable with the work in with both your life and your goals. Now. The very last point that we're going to cover in this short video is that the daily activity counting in your MyFitnessPal or in a tracking app. So sometimes you'll see that at the top of the app, it'll actually factor in your daily activity. It'll say, oh, you've done this many steps, so we're going to count that in towards your nutrition. 99% of the time, your coach or your you know, diet template or whatever it may be, they've already factored your daily intake, uh, daily output of activity into your calorie estimation. So if you have your app set up and it's opting in to include any additional activity, maybe it's connected to your steps, you do 10,000 steps and it says you burnt an extra you know, 600 calories or 200 calories, whatever it may be, and that's deducting it from your daily calorie target. And then you're like, sweet, I get to eat an extra 200 calories. That is not a good idea because it's already been factored in. Now you're counting it twice. Again, it might take you out of the sweet spot where you want to be to either lose weight, gain weight, whatever your goal is. And that could create problems and delay the process for you. So if you can, I would recommend turning that feature off. Try not to focus too much on it and you know, do your regular daily activity. Try and keep it consistent. Try and keep it as accurate as possible. But just know that that has already been factored into your targets. If it hasn't, or you're unsure, speak to you know your coach, the template support, whatever it may be, and see if you can work out whether you should or should not be doing it. Don't just presume that um, you know it hasn't been factored in and you're going to track that extra activity anyway. That is about it for from me today. Um, tracking macros is not that easy, but it is a rewarding um endeavor so if you can really invest in the process try and you know try and learn as much as you can be willing to make mistakes and know that you might and you will 
and that's fine. That's all part of the process. If I had a dollar for every mistake that I made over the years, I'd have a lot of dollars. The most important thing is when you make a mistake, you learn from it, keep that in mind, keep it in your back pocket, and then you just keep going. And now you're better for it. All right. Thanks for listening. I uh, hope that was enjoyable. Um, if you have any questions, make sure you drop them in the comments below and best of luck with your tracking endeavors.